Okay, so um, this is going to be a new type of video. I'm going to review a game. And um, this game was played between Lake and Wacker, a good friend of mine, and uh, Poex. Lake and Wacker uh, is a PhD candidate, and um, yeah, he's a great guy. And on my list, just 45 for 5 teams, so <laughs> you know who I was rooting for. Anyway, um, I hope this uh, game is instructive for uh, everyone. And especially the players, I hope they get something out of this video. Okay, so e4, e5, the king spawn opening, and uh, Laken, Laken chooses to go with knight f3. Um, he's not as crazy as I am, <laughs> go, going for uh, f4. So knight f3, knight c6, d4. Okay, so this is the scotch opening. Um, a little bit of history about the scotch opening. It was, mm, I would say like a regular opening uh, back before the 1990s but in the 1990s it was really revitalized because you know everyone copies the world champion and at that time Kasparov used it in his world championship match and uh, thus it uh, garnered a great degree of interest so uh, and now it's one of the main lines so you have the Rui Lopez here with bishop b5 and the Italian with bishop c4, and there's the Scotch also. It's a very nice opening also to play. And here we see the queen h4 variation. Here, um, bishop c5, uh, bishop uh, bishop b4 check, which is a favorite of Christoph Sielecki, the the I am, who has a YouTube channel, just explained. That if you haven't watched any of his videos, you really should. He's producing great content. And actually, on a side note, I'm glad to see him <laughs> back uh, making uh, his daily blitz videos. There's also Queen of Six and uh, a lot of other moves. Actually, let me turn on the opening book. You can see how many moves there are. There's Knight D4, Knight F6, D6, Queen of Six, etc. So Queen H4 is ranked um, the sixth most common move, and I think for good reason. Queen H4. Well, uh, when I was a 1700-1800 player and uh, the first time seeing this move um, back then I used to play the scouts so the first time seeing this move I was really shocked because it pins the f-pawn so you can't defend with f3 and it attacks the e-pawn and you can't go bishop d3 to defend because the knight would be hanging and you can't go queen e2 to defend because the knight would be hanging queen f3 also doesn't defend because of the same reason and something like g4 is completely insane it would just get hit with d6 or something. So, um, really the only way to defend is with knight c3, which is what was played in the game. There is also, I mean, queen d3, but after knight f6, your queen is misplaced, and this bishop seems silly. And maybe you, are, you can't feel keto it, but uh, the lead in development for black should give him a slight edge. So knight c3 seems to be the only move, but then comes bishop b4. And now you're facing some problems. Or seemingly so. But uh, the thing is, while Queen H4, I mean, it's not a refuted opening or anything, but uh, the main lines against Queen H4 give White quite a comfortable game. And more comfortable than what can be expected out of, like, the Mises variation of the Scotch. Which, uh, which uh, really is uh, close to equalizing for Black, I guess, you could say. So, um... So, uh... It's it's really it's really not such a great move this queen h4 but it is a very tricky move and unfortunately Laken fell right into it with bishop e3 so um, so bishop e3 isn't the most accurate but still White retains a very very slight edge I guess but uh, the most critical move is bishop e2 and by the way this game was really interesting because the opening phase I could speak a lot about because of this. Uh, Steinitz variation, which I hope is very helpful for everyone who plays the scotch, because the first time seeing this, I was like completely annoyed, I mean I can't move the f-pawn, I, I don't know how to defend the pawn, and I guess many people have fell for this trap, have fallen for this trap, so um, it's uh, very important to learn the correct uh, approach to, uh, to, this, uh, to this opening, and when you learn the correct approach, you should have an easy game, and should... Uh, well, expectedly win more white games in this opening uh, rather than lose. Um, so, um, and also the end game in this uh, in this game was very interesting, and we'll get to that later. Anyway, bishop e two is the correct move. What you have to do here 
is acknowledge that yes, white is winning the pawn. You, uh, queen d3 again here would be a very bad move because of knight f6. Well, I mean not completely terrible, but you're just misplacing the queen and it, it really doesn't make sense. But if, you're, um, if you're some sort of aggressive crazy player, maybe you can castle long here, I don't know. But, but it's not the best move for a reason. The best move is bishop e2, which quote on quote threatens, uh, quote threatens, unquote, uh, castles. Which is a very big threat actually, because what is the problem with uh, Black's setup? He's winning a pawn, yes, but the problem is that he's so far behind in development. So when you castle, so let's say um, Black goes for the spawn now and you castle, you're up two tempos. He needs one move and the second move to castle, while you're already castle. So this is a very big advantage actually. And uh, we'll see in the variations how white can exploit this. So that's why this move isn't so great. Even though technically it wins a pawn by force. Because the other options just give black equality to a slight advantage. The queen d3 lines we saw. So bishop e2. Now knight f6 is a way to put further pressure on the pawn. But we'll take a look at the most critical and I guess most, uh, most uh, likely to be played move. Which is queen takes e4. Here it's very important to, to realize what's the problem with um, Black's position, and that is the weak c7 pawn. Actually, as you'll see in this game, this c7 pawn was, was weak even though um, this exact line wasn't played. Anyway, the general characteristics of this opening mean that the c7 pawn is weak because the queen got out of here and thus this got out here and thus the c7 pawn wasn't defended. So that's one, one aspect we need to correctly assess. And uh, the other thing is that uh, there's really no good way of defending this pawn. So you have to lose castling rights with king d8. So this is exactly how we exploit it with knight b5. In uh, other variations we castle immediately and make use of our lead in pattern. So against knight f6 we castle immediately. Um, but here it's different because after queen takes e4, castling immediately would lose a knight, of course. And moving the knight anyway wouldn't make much sense. Like moving it to f3 and then uh, black should be okay here with maybe knight f6. But queen takes e4, knight b5. So now c7 is attacked. And if black decides to defend c7, we have the shot knight takes c7. Bam! Now black can't take because we take the queen. See, the bishop is overloaded. It has to guard against c7 and against the and pin the knight so that it can't take the queen. But with knight takes c7 check, we remove one of those functions. And after the king moves, we just win a clean rook. So after knight b5, well, maybe king d8 now is possible. But... Uh, What's tried usually is bishop takes c3 check, b takes c3. Notice how you take with the b pawn. It may be tempting to take here and attack the queen, but probably just queen takes here, or maybe the queen moves back at knight f6. So, um, and you, d you don't get uh, to attack c7. So taking with the, with, the, with the knight is very bad. So here maybe queen takes, or maybe just queen e7. Or even queen e5, I don't know. Um, yeah, whatever. But uh, the point is, you shouldn't do that. Because black is fine in all these lines. So b, b takes c3, and now you're attacking this. And now, really, there's no good way to defend it. Right? So, um, yeah, something like queen e5 would be met with f4. Notice how we're protecting c3 from queen takes c3 check. And now the queen has to can't defend c7 anymore, and you just win. So king d8 has to be played, and here we can just castle, and now the lead in development is tremendous. We may have we may have lost the pawn and have weak pawns to boot, but the developmental advantage and like these pieces. What what the hell are these pieces? Okay, a piece doesn't exist on b8. So what, what the hell are these pieces? Terrible. And the king isn't casted. So we can easily exploit this. Let's take a look at a few sample variations. So knight f6. 
rook b1. Rook b1 is very important because the bishop will go to f3 and the rook on b1 will add to the pressure on b7. This may seem far-fetched, but now it will become clear. a6, knight d4, so it takes d4. Now our pawn structure is repaired. And in this variation, we can see how white enjoys a big advantage. And the bishop pair, the pressure on b7, these pieces being dummies, this king uh, uncastled. And after a6, there's an interesting line with bishop f3. Queen g6 should probably be played, but if someone goes wrong with queen c4, now we get to see a very important point with knight d6. This knight on b5, or what's usually on d4, it really enjoys sacrificing itself in the Steinitz. So in the Steinitz, always consider these kinds of knight sacrifices. And uh, at this point will become clearer in, uh, in the, the other line with knight f6 with 6 knight f6 here. We sacrifice our knight a lot in that line as well. So here, black has to take, and after takes, now we're threatening this bishop check, which would be deadly, along after a check on the e-file as well. So knight f6, bishop e3, and now black shelters himself from the check by, uh, now if it check, we can at least move here. And, um, yeah, we're, <laughs> we're uh, trying to hold on as black. Okay, but after rook f e1, lining up with, uh, with on the e file, and threatening the bishop check now with, uh, with further, uh, further uh, pressure. So, b black prevents this with knight d5, prevents bishop b6 check. And after takes, takes, and the brilliant queen takes d5. Now after queen takes, we just get mated. So, um, yeah, black is lost. So after knight c4 and knight d6, uh, queen c4 and knight d6, black is lost. So black needs to go queen g6 here. But again, the pressure after knight d4, this basically transposes to the other line we saw here. I, I mean, it doesn't transpose, but it's, it reaches a similar uh, kind of general plan but still here um, black enjoys an edge uh, white enjoys an edge so let's take a look after bishop e2 at knight f6 and i know this is very detailed but it's uh, um if i if i were to make a video about the steinitz it would be much more detailed first of all and second of all i, le I left a great deal of things out and second of all it's very important uh, to know these ideas uh, for the to see how the game transpires uh, and uh, well it's just in general a very good idea to know this opening because Laken made uh, a big error in the opening. Anyway, knight of six castles of course. And now something like castles would be met by knight f5. This knight f5 move is very important. It's either knight b5 or knight f5, usually in the Steinitz. And now the queen would be trapped. And after d6, knight f3, again this knight move. Here it goes back because knight f5 would just be met with bishop f5. Queen h5 and now knight d5 is very strong. Threatening this, threatening this. And if takes and takes, we remove this guy and we have checks and checks along the C e file after we play c3 to remove the bishop from attacking e1. So yeah. And um, if the knight takes on e4, we go knight f5 again, and if takes, 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 and queen f6. Um, we take here, which seemingly sacrifices our rook. Of course, if queen f5, we have many moves here, but probably just bishop d3 and rook e1 check should be good. Um, c takes b4, queen takes a1, b5, very important move, this logic the knight, and now bishop a3. So now if the queen is taken, we have knight g7 with mate. So queen f6 back after bishop a3, queen f6. Now knight e7, heading for d5. c6 prevents d5, and now rook lines up, the rook lines up with the king on the e-file. Knight e6 blocks up the e-file a bit, but after bishop f3, getting onto the long diagonal, and d5 takes, takes, and now finally knight takes. And you can see here, 
but black is completely lost. And actually, checkmate. So that was knight f6, and we looked at bishop takes c3. I'm sorry, knight f6 castles, and we looked at bishop takes c3. We looked at castles. We looked sorry, uh, we like we looked at castles d6 and knight takes c4. Finally, we look at bishop takes c3. Here, after knight f5, queen takes e4, and bishop d3. Here, maybe knight g7 is possible, but nah. So, um, yeah, this bishop d3. Um, queen g4 and now f3 f3 is very important because you don't want to trade queens um, very, uh, which reminds me in the Steinitz you definitely don't want to trade queens because the, your whole point is that black's king is unsafe and when you trade queens especially in the Steinitz structure the black king would be safe and thus you lose all your f of, of your advantage and in fact you lose more than that because you're down a pawn initially so um, you should play very very precisely to uh, make use of this uh, of this material deficit so that this material deficit doesn't come back to haunt you I mean so queen g4 f3 very important and now queen a4 um, here actually if someone throws in a check with bishop d4 check which uh, as the saying goes Patser sees check Patser gives check actually here after king h1 the queen is trapped so uh, well queen g6 is possible but knight d6 check and uh, Bishop takes g6 will win the queen. So um, yeah, don't uh, don't give the check for no reason. Now queen a4 is played, and after b takes c3, king f8 was ba basically the only move, and it was tried in one game, which attempted to revive this line, but this line is terrible. Uh, not the well. Some would say the queen h4 line in its entirety, but I mean theoretically, I don't think it's that that bad. But uh, practically, it's quite quite difficult to play for black, and I really don't see why anyone would play it since white has all the fun. So uh, king f8. I mean, why would you voluntarily enter this position as black? Uh, yeah. Okay, I digress. So king f8. Actually, here the king f8 is the only move because such moves as castles. Again, we'll uh, see the sacrifice of this knight, this d4 knight initially, which went to f5. Before, we saw it sacrificing itself from b5 to d6. Now we'll see it sacrificing itself from f5 to g7. So knight takes g7 is a very strong move, and after king takes, and bishop check, um, the, of course, you shouldn't take back. Here, probably, knight e5 is the best move. But um, let's see why you shouldn't take back. So king takes g7, bishop h6 check. Of course, if you retreat or something, I have queen d2 or I could just take the rook. But let's say king takes h6 and now queen d2 check and uh, black is getting mated. After this, we have g4 check and king h1 and we're threatening bishop e2, rook f5, rook f6, intending to go here. And here, and uh, yeah, this is a massacre. And actually, if I open up the opening explorer, um, I think there was a game of Sergei Karyakins played in this opening. Yeah, but it didn't show in the opening explorer. Anyway, so um, basically that's it for bishop e2, for uh, the correct way to refute this queen h4 line. And now let's take a look at what happened in the game, which was unfortunate. Bishop e3. And, um, yeah, it does defend the pawn, but it, uh, it, uh, uh, sorry, it doesn't defend the pawn. It doesn't defend the pawn, and it's a developing move, but uh, it's not as strong as bishop e2 because you don't get to castle immediately. Okay, so, um, queen d3, and uh, actually queen d3 was played after, as you can see here, 10 minutes of thought, which was... Very unfortunate, because just going by on principle, you should never trade queens in this line. You're down a pawn. As I said before, if you trade queens, you're just worse. So, um, you're down a pawn, you can't trade queens. As simple as that. And here, actually, uh, white still had the shot knight b5. And, um, yeah, after knight b5, white still has a very, very slight edge, maybe. Or it's equal. But after queen d3, now black has a big advantage. Uh, well, not huge, but I mean he's just a pawn up in an endgame. 
queen takes d3, bishop takes d3. And now bishop takes c3 check, which uh, isn't strictly necessary, but okay, it's possible to damage white's pawn structure. Now g7 is fine, developing a piece, castles, and now the big mistake, castles. Let's just lose this, the c7 pawn. Instead, d6 was prudent. And now, if ever knight b5, you can go d8, and it's an end game, so you don't really have a problem here. So castles, knight b5, and um, yeah, black is just losing a pawn. I mean, he tried to, like, let's say, fake hold on to it with knight d5, but after c4, it's quite clear that the pawn will be lost. Um, but black does gain back the bishop pair, which is good. And still white has uh, these terrible pawns here, isolated and doubled. But the, the developmental advantage, especially with these pieces again, means that white is fine in this position. So takes, takes, and maybe knight e5 uh, is wrong, probably, because, I mean, there's no real reason to move the knight when you're so behind in development, right? You should maybe play, no, d5 just loses another pawn. You should maybe play d6 and bishop e6 and develop the rook. But knight e5 is chosen and after knight takes c7, rook b8, of course, getting out of the way of the knight. Knight d5 is unfortunately incorrect. Again, knight b5. In this uh, opening, knight b5 and knight f5 to a lesser degree are very important moves. Unfortunately, Lakin um, is concentrated on knight d5 because it's a like, seemingly strong outpost square. But uh, what uh, he failed to realize was that after knight b5, um, there's, well, basically a fork or a double attack. You're attacking a7, and should, like, a6 be played, you go to d6. And from d6, the knight utterly freezes everything. Everything. If this d-pawn can't move, then the bishop can't move, and if the bishop can't move, then the rook can't move, and if the rook can't move, then these rooks can't be connected. Sorry, my bad. So, it's basically this chain reaction. And this chain reaction actually happens, I'd like to give an example here, after e4... Um, e5 and something like bishop d3. This move is another chain reaction type of move. And uh, this this term uh, I'm quite fond of because I came up with it myself. So yeah, patent pending. <laughs> so bishop d3, um, it initiates the chain reaction where the d-pawn is blocked. And the d-pawn is blocked means that this bishop is blocked. And this bishop being blocked means that this rook is blocked. And since this rook is blocked by the bishop, it can't connect with this rook. So this is the chain reaction initiated here. And if we return to our game, knight d6 does the same thing. Black is probably forced to sacrifice a pawn after it takes, 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 takes. And now rook ab1 should pick up this pawn. Or force black into utter passivity. Here there is rook f4 and rook, uh, rook f2 b4. So, um, yeah. Black is struggling in this position. But unfortunately, knight d5 was played. And d6, okay, finally developing. Rook a, b1. Sensible, attacking the b-pawn. And now bishop e6. Maybe here, um, knight c5, uh, knight c7 is possible. Um, yeah, but th that does hang c4. Anyway, okay, rook b4 is played. Which, oh, so uh, Lakin here actually wanted to go knight c7, that's why he protected c4. Not, not a shabby idea, Lakin, good job. And rook e8 basically falls, like when you see a move like rook b4, I mean, white, if white wanted to double on the b file, he could have done so from any other square. So like from b2, you have to ask yourself as black, why did he double from b4? And unfortunately in this game, black wasn't using any of his time, so um, that's, that's a very, very bad idea. Especially in uh, long time control games. And frankly, it's a bit disrespectful. But anyway, maybe he had somewhere to go, we don't know the situation. Anyway, um, um, 
yeah, ruk before, you have to ask yourself, why the ruk went to before, and the, if the intention w- were to double only, then why did the ruk go to before and not to like B5 or B2? And then you realize from this kind of questioning that actually the rook went to before to protect C4. So that means that Lakin wants to remove this knight from here, but, but he'll have sufficient defense because now he has two defenders. So when you play rook F E8, you're basically entering into what uh, Lakin wa- uh, le- uh, the trap Lakin set up. Basically, so knight c7, it's just that. And here you fix white's pawn structure, which is, I mean, I guess it's fine in this position, but it's just a bad idea on principle as well. And now, rook e7, okay, I guess. It seems like a bit of an awkward square, but maybe possible. And now, the big mistake Laken commits is knight takes e6. Now, this is a very important principle which will be basically the core or the crux of this video. The concept is that to take is a mistake. And uh, there's this video on YouTube by Igor Smirnov about this concept, to take is a mistake. And I can't tell you how true it is, like to what extent the, the truth behind it is. In fact... I think for developing players, teaching them this rule is uh, like hammering it down constantly, not just teaching them once and forgetting about it. Hammering it down constantly will make them much, much, much better players. And I noticed this in my own development. When crossing the 2000 mark in Blitz, uh, I noticed that uh, I the, the the quality of my moves, the the ability to keep the tension this is what to take as a mistake is about it's about relieving the tension too early like intermediate players just have this problem where they have to take pieces their instinct is to take uh, to simplify this is a very bad habit and the reason is because keeping the tension increases the complexity of the position so this increasing complexity while you may think it's becoming simplified and it truly is But on the other hand, you're letting your opponent have a freer hand. You're you're relieving the pressure on your opponent. While if you keep the tension, you not only uh, block some of your opponent's chances, like you stop him from doing certain moves, from developing freely, you restrict him or her, uh, but you also give him or her a bigger chance to make mistakes. And that's that's really important. So this uh, this concept is is extremely extremely crucial. And here Lakin, instead of taking, he should have just gone back to b5, whereupon he had a fork. Now we're just applying the principle to take is a mistake, and lo and behold, we got a fork in return. It's not that oh yeah he, I missed a fork and you go about doing things like you've done them before a million times. No, that's wrong thinking. You need to see why you're making the mistakes. And the reason here after rook e7, you didn't miss the fork with knight b5. No, the problem here is that you have this taking instinct, this instinct to take everything off the board, this instinct to simplify. And that's what needs to be removed for your development as a chess player. So knight takes e6 is wrong, and knight b5 is the correct move, forking these two pawns. After d5, you might be able to take on a7, but the computer gives a very nice line. Um, I won't really delve too deeply into it, but here you can see the fork. And after this move, you have back rank issues, so like the bishop going to 8 would be utterly passive, you'd go a4 and crush it, or maybe just took c8. But uh, rook e6 here to protect against the back rank, and now e4 and the pawn gets rolling. Um, this may be drawn with correct play, but definitely white has a big advantage, especially in the practical game. Um, anyway, just a fun line uh, to see, but uh, after knight b5 you really don't need to calculate too much. You're forking two pawns, and that should be well enough. This computer line is uh, way too complicated, and I doubt any human would find it. And especially... Uh, <laughs> 
Lincoln's opponent in this game wasn't using any time, so he wouldn't have been able to calculate that far. But anyway, this equal rook endgame arises, and uh, this happened, and I like the way Lakin activated his king. Compare what white is doing to what black is doing. This was a very nice idea by Lakin. Here, maybe, maybe this would have been better. But g5 is also fine, gaining space. And here after rook takes f3, I had king takes f3 in mind because I want to enter here, push my pawns and start... Sorry, these are very bad arrows. So I want to go here, push my pawn, or my pawn, or well pawns maybe, depending on what black does, and with my king munch on these pawns. So that was my idea, and in fact, while at low depth Stockfish doesn't like this idea very much, well, not very much, I mean it's like... Um, there's a 0 0.4 difference between king takes f3 and g takes f3 at higher depths and at depth 34 Which is when I stopped the analysis because you know, I'm not spending all day on this analysis um, actually um, It prefers king takes f3 very slightly So i um, glad to hear that but uh, they're both uh, Glad to see that but uh, they're both fine. I mean, it's not but my king takes f3 move isn't revolutionary uh, G takes f3 is of course principled, you're getting a pawn closer to the center, but you do also create this isolated h pawn. Uh, usually in end games though, isolated, isolated uh, flag pawns are good, but uh, it remains to be seen how good they are in this game. Um, well, actually in this game, the, the h pawn is a winner, but okay, well, I'm sort of spoiling the game. <laughs> so king g7 is played, king g4, king g6, okay, just inching your king closer, N nothing remarkable about these moves rook b5, okay, so attacking the g-pawn, that's a nice idea Allowing, allows h5 check though, but that's not a big problem, you just retreat and now you argue that these pawns are too far advanced and maybe weaknesses b6 is played so you need to play b6 eventually so that your rook can move, your rook can't just stay passively defending and in fact in end games, as the saying goes you'd rather be a pawn down with an active rook than uh, equal number of pawns but with a passive rook so um, yeah you just want to activate your rook h4 is a nice move attacking the g pawn basically forcing it uh, forcing it to make a decision and here the decision is to capture and it's basically the only decision because after g4 you lose the pawn so um, the decision here is to capture and if you don't do anything, the pawn is lost as well. So the decision is to capture, and after rook f8, attack with this pawn. Um, uh, e5 was possible because it sort of blocks this rook from attacking this pawn. And now maybe later d5 is possible, and uh, this rook move gains in strength a bit. But anyway, rook f8 is played, which is maybe a slight error, and after rook g5 check, king uh, f6 is chosen. And um, here I don't get why the pawn wasn't taken. Maybe Lakin thought that uh, you can take it at any point, but that's not a good idea in general in these types of endgames, because you have some weaknesses here on the board. Which, uh, well, this weakness can't be attacked, but this weakness, so... By delaying the capture, like what Lakin did with e4, a6 here, black actually had king e7. And now you you have to defend the pawn, basically, it's the only move. And now there's h4 check. And if you, like, move again, there's h3. And you eventually have to take the pawn, and you lose the pawn. So, uh, maybe here this is possible, but then check, I guess. Um, yeah... And now check would be bad, but maybe just here. Now this pawn gets lost. So, um, yeah. I guess that's one way to... to For black to play better, I mean. But a6 was played. And uh, so this is the point here that we should have just captured the pawn. But admittedly, it's not so easy to see why. But, yeah, that's what should have been played. And again here, uh, king e7, so a4. Uh, now probably, yeah, f4 was better than a4. Because you want to push through with f5. And then, like, after f5, if your opponent goes e5, you have this very strong rook on g6. 
And if your opponent captures it, you can take with check, and uh, the king at pawn endgame should be winning. So, um, yeah, e4 is a step in the wrong direction. And here, if you're forced to play rook g3, yeah, that, that's when you know something's a bit iffy. But uh, in fact, rook g3 isn't so bad. I mean, the rook is a bit passive. Here, probably, yeah, d5, and uh, you saddle white with uh, isolated pawns. Which should be, which should, this should be a draw. Anyway, king f6 is played. I don't know, just moving back and forth. I mean, uh, this is senseless. You should do something. This is not how you'll achieve a draw. Black can, white can just improve his position and he did so with f4. Rook h8. So defending the pawn, but this is what, this is passive defense. So now black is basically lost. Rook g5, e5. And uh, the pawn is pushed past. And again, this was <laughs> the idea that should have been played earlier with f5. So b5 is played. a takes, a takes. Probably you should start with c takes. Note. Because here, okay, you transpose to the same position. But note that after a takes b5 here, black had this option. Now, this doesn't seem to work in this current position. But it was an option nevertheless. So good endgame technique would have you taking with the C-pawn. And that's another note Lakin should keep in mind. Now here this endgame is completely winning. Now here black just gives the white an extra tempo. I mean just take the pawn here. But again, he was playing at the speed of lightning. You can see here, he has an hour on the clock. After check, king f6 check, and the king finally gets through. Now here, probably I like f6 check more, but it shouldn't be much of a difference. Here, actually, king f6 needed to be played. So now, if ever the rook captures, you have rook a7 threatening rook a8 mate. So let's say this happens, you have rook a7 and your threatening mate. And if like the rook goes back to passive defense, you just munch on these pawns and you have three connected passed pawns. So that was more accurate. Here I don't I didn't like this maneuver either. So here just go back to checking. And if he returns to King of 8, I don't know, play something else. Play this maybe. This ma this uh, check is very awkward because it kind of blocks up this whole position. Now if you want to move the pawn, you have to contend with losing your rook. So it's just an awkward uh, awkward move, and uh, uh, rook h6 is uh, an admission of such. Uh, is, a, is an admission of such. Now takes, takes, check, and king, c, uh, king c6. King f6 is good. And now here. Here Lakin just took the pawn. But here, actually, we should be patient. When you take the pawn with e5 and he takes with check, which is what happened in the game, now you have these two disjointed pawns. This is of course winning for white, but it's not an easy win at all. And in fact, Lakin ended up uh, messing this up. So what was more prudent is acknowledging that this kind of structure will, will just disappear. It's very easy for this kind of structure to disappear. So, uh, so there is no like defense for the structure. These two pawns are going to go away. So after d5, you should go king e6, um, forcing uh, black to take or to push past. Now if he pushes past, of course, f6 just wins. So this, f6 just wins. And if he does something, well, takes, we take back, and now this pawn will be lost, and we have this pawn marching through. And uh, if he does something like maintaining the tension with rook a5, which I doubt uh, Poex would have played, now we have this check, and after rook takes, we can play this check. Forcing the simplification into a very easy, easily winning king and pawn endgame. So, prudent, uh, so um, caution should have been exercised, and king e6 should have been played. Because these disjointed pawns, it's not easy at all to win. But actually, Lakin's endgame technique was very good. Except for this point, where he needlessly chases after the rook. d5 should just be easily winning here. 
Why chase, chase after the rook? It's unclear to me. And now here, um, okay, yeah, here is where Laken must stop. King f3 is a terrible move. You should go here. King f3, king d3, and you just push the pawns. You have no problems. But the problem with king f3 is that it cuts off your own king. So now this rook is cutting off the king. And how do you go back? If you want to block the rook's control over the file, like, um, actually king g5 was played, but rook, like, okay, so king f3, your rook was cut off. So what black needs to do is keep the rook on this file. So rook d7, uh, rook e7. And now if you want to, like, block the file, um, it's... It, it doesn't do anything because the rook could just move. Is this the most accurate? Let me check with the table base. Um, yeah, rook d7 is the only drawing move. Haha. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so now how do you protect your pawns while advancing them? It's basically impossible. If you want to protect your pawn like this, um, rook d6 maintaining the pressure on the d file is just drawn. Because now you can't push the pawn. If you want to do something like this, you lose the pawn. So after rook e7, you have no clear way to make progress. So, and if you push, let's say, there's this move. And this should be an easy draw. So, uh, yeah, the Laken must stop by cutting off his own king. But uh, fortunately, his opponent didn't notice that and went king g5. And now f6 just... Uh, and I really like this move by Laken, king f2, very nice. And now uh, also f7, and uh, yeah, the end game was easily winning. Just went to top position, and it was easily winning. Uh, funny enough, I mean, his opponent offered zero resistance, like rook e8, I mean... <laughs> yeah, he was just moving too quickly. An hour and 21 minutes, that should never happen. Now, even if he won, I would berate uh, Poex, because uh, having an hour, 21 minutes, I don't care, even if you beat Magnus Carlsen with that amount of time, <laughs> it's it's just not uh, healthy, unless you had the game all prepared, but uh, I doubt, uh, like you're playing this end game all from preparation, come on, let's be real here. Okay, so uh, we'll discuss the fine points in the summary, and... Uh, and uh, yeah, the key concepts and the other parts of the video. So first of all, some opening improvements. Um, definitely we need to play 5 knight c3, follow it up with uh, 6 bishop e2, and then castle quickly. And of course if queen takes e4 we have knight b5. So yeah, we should go for rapid development even though we sacrifice a pawn. But it's because defending the pawn isn't quite feasible. And in general, we shouldn't trade queens when down a pawn, of course, uh, material in general also. We shouldn't uh, trade queens when we're down material in general. Um, of course, we need to uh, keep up the pressure and uh, yeah, just try to attack uh, the other side of the, if the king is weak or something like that. And to take as a mistake, very important concept, don't release the tension too early on, this is a very important concept for uh, beginners and intermediate players. Keep the tension to make your opponent make mistakes and to restrict his or her options. And always create harmony between your pieces, if you remember the rook e6 move in the end game, that was bad because we couldn't push through with uh, f6. And uh, don't cut off your king in the end game. Um, uh, yeah, we need our king, of course, king activity is very important in the end game, and uh, we need the king, we need to use the king to be able to escort the pawn and um, to push through our past pawn to, uh, to make a queen. And uh, for the key concepts, uh, first of all, of course, to take as a mistake, this is the most important concept you should learn from this video, so don't relieve the tension too early on. And don't trade queens when down material, always keep the tension that way, keep the queens on the board. Um, don't, don't just, uh, don't just uh, lose your attacking potential because you're so fixated on trading pieces and trading down. And again, don't cut off your king in the endgame. And as a corollary, we can say don't uh, cut off your opponent's king in the endgame. So cut off your opponent's king in the endgame. 
so that uh, he or she is not able to escort the pawns, the past pawns. And uh, the king is worth four pieces according to Steinitz, and it's funny because this is Steinitz video. So, um, or an opening about the, the open, uh, or a video about the opening. So, yeah, uh, use your king. Okay, so knowing what we know about uh, Laken's uh, weaknesses in the past game, maybe we can apply the same principles in this game and um, hopefully correct these uh, mistakes or errors Laken is doing. So, uh, I, unfortunately I won't be able to give this game uh, a proper review because it would take another hour <laughs> and this video is getting way too long. Um, but we'll take a quick look at it. So the Tarash and um, C3. I'm not so sure this is the most common move, but alright, it's a move. And here taking as well. Okay, this is fine. Okay, here actually to take is not a mistake because after taking you get the open E file. So you take, take, and then you castle. And this open e file counts for something, and obviously black castling queenside would be suicide. Yeah, and uh, a sort of isolated pawn position. But okay, castles is fine. So the pawn is taken, and this is actually a good gambit, because um, yeah, you're getting a good development. And here maybe taking is better. And rook e1 check. But anyway, bishop... Oops, that was bad. Again, I keep doing the same <laughs> mistake with my mouse. Uh, with my keypad. And yeah. Okay, here queen c6 is played. And yeah, gaining a tempo with knight e5. And the later bishop f4 should have been tried. But okay, taking. So, this is uh, one point. Uh take to take as a mistake so uh, now it's actually a mistake because because in this case this is why it's a mistake black can just recapture with the queen and now you don't have an open e file and again to take him is, is a mistake the king still isn't that safe and these kingside pieces aren't developed so i would have played queen e2 or at least strongly considered queen e2 oh wait actually queen e2 hangs bishop b5 Mm, not good. So I would have played well, bishop d2, just blocking the queen, and um, yeah, later rook e1 and bishop b3, bishop c3. So these kinds of moves, and white should have a better game. But anyway, queen d5 and the end game. Um, here I'm not sure what's better, this move or the check. But anyway, okay, okay. Mm, I would have considered bishop g5 here to at least threaten to damage black's pawn structure and bishop f4 also to prevent queenside wait it doesn't prevent queenside castle <laughs> no the chess rules yeah but uh, yeah bishop f4 just developing a piece as well uh, bishop d2 oh oh yeah bishop d2 is very passive so very passive square for the bishop Anyway, the main point in looking at this game is to realize that taking is a mistake. And already here, well here it's advantageous because of the e-file, so the exception proves the rule. But here it's not advantageous because he can just recapture with the queen and you don't get the e-file. And here again there's no reason to take, you should keep the tension, your opponent is underdeveloped at the king at the center. You should keep the queens on the board and play bishop d2 probably. Or maybe even knight d2 is a consideration actually, but yeah. And here this move is too passive. Uh, it does have a nice idea in mind, which is going to c3. But yeah, after king f8, this is an endgame. You can't go to f8. This isn't really a queenless middle game. There's no, There are no real threats to the black king or the white king for that matter. So uh, yeah, this wasn't much of a threat. f6 was a weakening move. I don't know why I didn't go for king f8. King f8 also unpins this bishop, so it's a very logical move. Anyway, this happened. And here, actually, again, taking is not a mistake, but there's a clear tactical point here. 
which is takes takes bishop a4 and now you have to lose oogles of material now this position is easily winning two pawns up with the bishop pair so only take if it's justified tactically of course i don't want people <laughs> i had some of my students like make this joke um, so if my opponent's queen is hanging, I don't take it. No, no, you take the queen if it's hanging. To take is a mistake in general. <laughs> okay, so now to take is a mistake because there's no real purpose behind it. So Laken is just trading off all pieces, maybe in hopes of making a draw. But again, that's not a good idea because you're relieving the tension. And relieving the tension is what makes you not make draws and lose instead of helping you make draws. And this happened. I won't go too deeply into the end game. Again, black should have. Now it's black's turn to make the to take to uh, to break this uh, rule to take a mistake. So rook a8, just keeping the tension. This move, um, while he, he himself isn't taking, but he's letting his opponent trade pieces, which is. A type of relieving the tension and now it's an end game I mean I get getting the king to the center but this is this just seems like applying general principles here you need to go concrete con you need to play concretely and play a4 and get this past pawn and okay here is an, a very important point to take is a mistake and the pawn is taken and the, the advantage just slips away here king d4, it boxes out this king, so it boxes out this king, it threatens the pawn, so after you push you can take the pawn, of course when you have your bishop here I mean, and you have this, and this blocking the king, and this later on, and you can put more pressure on c4 as well, and the king is optimally placed in the center. The computer gives the following line, and uh, why it should be close to winning here maybe it's a draw though but you have also this avenue of breaking through on the king side so um, yeah it should probably be winning but to take is a mistake and unfortunately for Laken here he blundered his bishop so yeah I think this is a good game to illustrate the concepts in the video especially the to take is a mistake concept so for our fun fact, um, the official language in Rwanda is Kenya Rwanda, a language belonging to the Niger Congo family of languages, which constitute one of the world's major language families. And of course, it's not the only official language in Rwanda, but uh, it's basically the main one. And for the future considerations, um. Can you think of chess positions in which it is good to trade as an advantageous queens when down in material? And what is the most high level game to feature the Steinitz variation we saw? And what do you think is the best outcome of the Steinitz variation? Is it a win? Is it a loss? Or is it a draw for black? So what's the best outcome there? Um, thank you for watching.